pretty clean, doesn't it? But today I'm not going to get away with it because I've got a microbiologist with me. It's Liz Scott. Hello, Liz. Hello there. Liz, what do you do? I specialise in looking for bacteria or germs, as everybody calls them, in the home. And what do your bacteria or germs look like then, Liz? Well, they're very tiny little organisms which we can't see with the naked eye, so we have to collect them, take them back to the laboratory and grow them up so there's enough of them to look at. And when there's a whole mass of them in a colony, it's obviously more obvious what you're dealing with. Quite, yeah. then we can see them. Is a kitchen a good place then to find this sort of thing? Yes. Bacteria really like growing in warm, moist conditions with plenty of food around. Mm. And the kitchen sink's a good place to start because it's quite warm in the kitchen and it's moist and there are plenty of food particles hanging around. All right then, Liz, well, let's see what you're going to we'll do. We'll start sampling the YouTube here with this pipette. Liz put the sample in a sterile, germ-free bottle so it wouldn't be contaminated by any other bacteria. She brought a whole range of equipment to help her track down where the bacteria were worst. So what we're going to be looking at next then, Liz? Let's use a different technique and sample this dishcloth. I'm going to make direct contact with this jelly in a contact plate. Uh, and your bacteria are going to stick to the red jelly, I suppose? That's right, and that jelly provides food for them to grow on. Oh. And I'm <laughs> also going to swab them with this cotton swab. That's yet again another method that you're using there. That's right. I suppose it acts as a double check then, using two methods. Quite. Liz finished off sampling the sink with another contact plate and a quick swab of the taps. After that, she went down the rest of the kitchen, sampling the smoke top, the greasy table, the chopping board, the bread board, and the drying up towel. <laughs> You're even doing the fridge. You don't find bacteria in there as well, do you? Yes, bacteria grow in the fridge too. The cold just makes them grow more slowly. Liz did a pretty thorough job in the kitchen, but that's only half the story. Next, the samples have to be grown in the lab. The swabs were streaked onto plates of agar jelly, which comes in two different colours. The white jelly provides food for most types of bacteria. The red jelly is best for growing bacteria from the human gut. The contact plates don't need anything more doing to them, and when all the other samples were done, they were all placed in a water. It's kept at 37 degrees Celsius, about human body temperature, which suits the bacteria really well. So they're left to grow overnight. Next day, when she got the results, I asked Liz to tell us what she'd found. Right. Well, as we find in lots of kitchen sinks, a lot of bacteria growing on the kitchen sink. This is a moist sink area. A lot of food and rubbish goes down the sink and you have a lot of bacteria growing. So many you can't even see individual bacteria. When I put the street plate up here, you still can't even see any individual bacteria growing. So many growing there. I was quite surprised to find there are not as many bacteria growing in the YouTube as we do find. Uh, that may have been because a lot of water got flushed down in the mor morning with cleaning up and so on and they got diluted. The tap Although I do expect to find bacteria contaminating the tap area, which is a sort of high-packed area, you get to... Uh, I think there's more bacteria on this tap than we'd normally expect to find. But the whole sink area was so heavily contaminated that I expect they've got transferred to the tap as well in that way. And what about the cleaning cloth? Well, the dishcloth is nearly always the worst. And again, this dishcloth... You can't even see any individual bacteria, so many growing there. The dishcloth is a nice, moist, warm place with lots of bits of food particles in it, and the bacteria really love that area. But it's quite interesting to compare that with a dry cloth. For instance, the drying up cloth itself, very few bacteria growing on that. They don't grow in dry areas very well. And the same was true of the smooth, dry worktop. Very few bacteria there. But the rough breadboard produced all these. They live on the food and grease trapped in the cracks of the wood. And the chopping board had lots of cuts and scratches and bacteria. Even the fridge had quite a few back, slowed down but not killed by the cold. If you use a dye to stain the bacteria, they show up better under the microscope.
This one magnifies them a hundred times. Staining also helps sort them out into their different types. And live bacteria are even more amazing. bacterium pretty fast. In fact, in 15 hours, one single bacterium can produce a million more. But don't panic. We've got Liz Scott again with us here today. And Liz also does research work into the best ways of cleaning up the bacteria. Now, we've got quite a few household cleaners here. There's all sorts. So which would you say is the best, Liz? Well, we can use detergents to actually remove the grease and dirt that we can see. Yeah, that's deter washing up liquid, soap powder, detergents, yeah. That's right. But to kill bacteria properly, we need to use a disinfectant. Mm -hmm. There's quite a wide range of disinfectants, and some really are just a nice smell. But to do a good job, you need to use sodium hypochlorite, mm -hmm. the ones we know as common household bleach. Which is this selection of things here, isn't it? That's yeah. right. So how do you know those are the <clears> best, Liz? Well, just as you saw me sampling surfaces in the home, we can do a similar thing for testing disinfectants. Yeah. And if you look at these three agar plates here. Here's a surface before we treated it with anything at all, a mm -hmm. lot of bacteria growing on it. And here's a surface after we've wiped it down with mm. still a lot of bacteria on that plate. And then there's a surface that we've wiped down with sodium hypochlorite. No bacteria. That, at that's all. killed them all off, that's you right. yeah, as you said. So it really works. Mm. How do we use bleach on a surface then, Liz? Well, for sinks, drains and loos, we can use it neat from the bottle. Yeah. But for actually on a work surface, you have to dilute it with water. Mm. And as they all vary in strength, and we need to follow the instructions on the label for that. Yeah, they've all got quite a lot of instructions too, so <laughs> make a note of that. Look, Liz, if detergents get rid of the grease and the dirt that the bacteria live on, but bleach kills them completely, why not just mix them both together? Well, you can actually buy thickened bleaches that have a detergent in them and remove the grease and kill the bacteria in one mm. go. But it's not a good idea to mix our own cleaning chemicals at home, because for a start, you might just stop the disinfectant working. Yeah. And also, it could be a dangerous thing to do. Oh, I'll <laughs> leave that then. Listen, Liz, will we ever get rid of bacteria completely? No, we won't. But at least we can stop them growing too good in the wrong places. Mm. <laughs> it's a relief anyway. Liz, thanks a lot. covered in skin, nearly two square metres of it, and that's a lot to keep clean, especially when you realise that it contains three million sweat glands, and that can make a litre of sweat a day, or even that much in an hour if it's very hot, or if you're very active. So it's not surprising that a lot of research is done into deodorants and antiperspirants. Dr Malcolm Kennelly is from the Boots Consumer Products Research Lab. What's the problem with sweat, Malcolm? Well, there's no problem with fresh sweat. It smells quite sweet. But as soon as the bacteria on the skin start to break it down, then it begins to smell. And one of the smelliest places is under the armpits, isn't That's it? Right. In fact, take a look at this T-shirt. You can see lots of skin bacteria, but they are worst under the arms. Yes, we need to get rid of the bacteria under the armpits, and uh, we use a deodorant or an antiperspirant to do this. How can you check that the deodorant is doing its job? Well, we use an agar here, which contains bacteria, and we place a drop of deodorant in the centre here, incubate the, the plate for 24 hours and that's the result right yes there there's quite a lot of bacteria growing around the outside here but not at all much here in the middle is there yes this clear zone is where the deodorant has stopped the bacteria from multiplying um, this is called a zone of inhibition test now deodorants are not the same as antiperspirants are they no both will stop you smelling but the antiperspirant will cut down how much you sweat and Malcolm's lab also uses a sweat test to see how well antiperspirants work. So if you want to have a go yourself, you can use this test to measure the amount of sweat you make during 10 minutes of exercise. Well, what have we got to do to start? Well, first of all, we need an exercise bike and a volunteer. I know the man. Charton. <laughs> <laughs> go on, just this once then. How are we well, going to measure his sweat? Well, we're going to weigh it and we're going to use these pads to up the sweat. You've got them in boxes? Well, that's to stop the sweat evaporating once we've collected it from Charton. Right, OK. You weigh, I'll note it down. That's the left. The left weighs 58.88 grams. 58.88. 
and the right weighs 60.69 grams. 60.69. Now that's before. That's right. Dry. Now he puts them on, does he? Oh, right. <laughs> Is that okay now? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. So, Mal, ten minutes exercise on this thing, then I can stop, can I? Yes, and ten minutes rest to mop up any more sweat, and then we'll weigh the pads again. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm going to need ten minutes rest, I think. Right, let's go. Ten minutes up now. So now for ten whoops whoops. <laughs> now for ten minutes rest. Oh more wobbly. <laughs> yeah. Well that's my ten minutes rest. Now for some results. Right, let's have the left one first. Thank you. So you're going to weigh the left one first, aren't we you? We will, yes. The left one weighs 60.22 grams. 60.22 grams. And the right one weighs 62.12 grams. 62.12 grams. Right. The left arm pad and box now weigh 60.22 grams. They started off weighing 58.88 grams. So, we do some subtraction there. 60.22 grams minus 58.88 grams, giving an answer of 1.34 grams for the amount of sweat from under your left armpit jarton. Good. <laughs> now, let's try the right one. The right arm pad and its box now weigh 62.12 grams. Before, they weighed 60.69 grams. So, let's do that on the calculator. 62.12 grams minus 60.69 grams equals 1.43 grams. So it's 1.43 grams of sweat from the right armpit. So why are we testing both armpits, Malcolm? Well, when we test antiperspirants, we only treat one armpit, then we can compare it to the untreated one. I see, and presumably when you've put antiperspirant under an armpit, that one hardly sweats at all. Antiperspirants don't stop you sweating completely. Um, it should cut down sweat by about a third. That's the sort of result I'd get in my lab, using a group of people under controlled conditions. So, if you want to have a go yourself, do a sweat test, first without the antiperspirant, and then put the antiperspirant on just one armpit. Give it an hour or so to start working, and then do the test again. You can compare the two results to see how they've changed. And it's interesting to try out different types of antiperspirant as well. Try doing the sweat test with different sorts of exercise. Find out which one is the sweatiest. When it comes to food, it's vital that everything's kept very clean. Now, we're all eating more and more meals away from home in canteens, cafes and restaurants. And it's one of the jobs of the environmental health officer to make sure they come up to certain standards. Uh, Mr. Faulty. Hello. Uh, these premises do not come under required by this authority. Uh, specifically, 
Lack of proper cleaning routines. Dirty and greasy filters. Greasy and encrusted deep fat fryer. Dirty cracked and stained food preparation surfaces. Dirty cracked and missing wall and floor tiles. Dirty marked and stained utensils. Dirty and greasy interior surfaces of the ventilator hoods. Yes, about the deep fat fryer. Inadequate no. temperature control and storage of dangerous foodstuffs. Storage of cooked and raw meat in same trays. Storage of raw meat above confectionery with consequent dripping of meat juices onto cream products. Yes, say no more. Um, food handling <laughs> routines, suspect. Evidence of smoking in food preparation area. Dirty and grubby food handling overalls. Lack of wash hand basin, which you gave us a verbal assurance you'd have installed on our last visit six months ago, and two dead pigeons in the water tank. <laughs> Otherwise OK? <laughs> yeah, and we've got a real environmental health officer here studio today, Sarah Rappleby. Hello. Listen, are those the sort of things that you look out for when you're working? Yes, you have to be very careful about hygiene when preparing food. Mm -hmm. um, bacteria like the same food as us, so if, they, if you let them grow, they can cause food poisoning. Yeah, well, we all know it's important to wash your hands before a meal, but how important would you say it is? Oh, very important. Have a look at this handprint. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can sit there, the fingers and everything, there's a thumb. And that's all bacteria. That's right. This is a lip print here, isn't it, I understand? Yes, and that shows the reason why you shouldn't smoke near food. Well, I thought that was to stop ash and so forth. Oh, well, that's part of the reason. Mm. But it's really because every time you touch your lips, bacteria can be put onto the food. So, in fact, licking your fingers and having a little dip in is not a very good idea. Definitely not, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, most food has some bacteria on it already, doesn't it? Yes, and raw meat's one of the worst. Eight out of ten raw chicken bacteria called salmonella. Uh, that's one that causes a pretty nasty food poisoning, isn't it? Yes, but if you cook the food properly, it should kill all the bacteria. So you must keep raw meat separate from cooked meat, such as like that ham? Yes, even the cooked meat can get reinfected by the raw meat. Right, well, if we keep food at the right temperature, that should stop the bacteria growing too quickly. Yes, you should either keep food very hot or very cold. Mm -hmm. If I was doing an inspection, hot food would have to be kept hotter than 63 degrees Celsius or colder than 10 degrees Celsius. And what happens in between? Well, that's the danger zone when bacteria can grow very quickly and they may co cause food poisoning. Although it can be dangerous to grow some bacteria, you should be quite safe with these. They're very useful. They help you turn milk into yoghurt. And if you want to make some yoghurt yourself, it's very easy. What you need is a pint of sterilised milk. Now, that's the long-life sort or the high sort. You can use ordinary pasteurised milk, but you must boil that first and then let it cool. Anyway, whatever milk you decide to use, it's best to add an extra tablespoon of dried milk because that does help the yoghurt set better. Right, so start with a clean bowl, a tablespoon of natural yoghurt, stir in the milk, stir it well, and then cover it over and put it for a few hours in a warm place or maybe overnight. Try keeping it at different temperatures. See what that does to the yoghurt. And you can test the milk before you start to see if it's acid. Compare that to the yoghurt afterwards. Anyway, when it's ready, you can eat your yoghurt plain or try designing your own flavours. Either way, it's a pity all bacteria don't taste as nice as these. Beautiful. <laughs>